Uh, welcome to the American Society of Comparative Law. Uh, we're having a conversation with Richard S. K. Uh, very excited to have you here today, Richard. Not only Associate Dean of UConn School of Law, but also the Wallace Stevens Professor of Law. And speaking of poetry and literature, uh, the reason we're here today is um, Professor K has written a really beautiful tome, uh, The Glorious Revolution and the Continuity of Law, that was published in 2014 by Catholic University of America Press. And we just wanted to sort of chat about that a little bit today with you. So uh, let me ask you a question. Yes. So could you frame for us a little bit about what this plot or the story is about to get a sense? The Revolution of 1688, um, which actually occurred in 1688 and 1689, uh, was uh, the moment when James II, uh, King of England, uh, was expelled uh, by his nephew and his daughter, uh, William, uh, William of Orange, and his mm -hmm. wife, uh, Princess Mary. Um, and uh, William and Mary were subsequently proclaimed king and queen of England. Uh, James was very unpopular uh, with the political class because he was a Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, and he was also not a quiescent Roman Catholic. He um, was uh, actively forwarded the uh, interests of Catholics. As I say, that he tried to fill every office he could with a Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, and indeed he was having trouble finding Catholics uh, to fill <laughs> all the offices. Uh, he, was, uh, he was kind of a, a stubborn man, mm -hmm. uh, an authoritarian man, had a, a very elevated view of the powers of the monarchy, uh, and this didn't, this didn't uh, coexist well with the, the prevailing political opinion. So in, 17, in December of 17, uh, 1688, uh, James took ship, uh, fled to France, never to come back. He later tried to reconquer his kingdom by uh, invading Ireland, and he was in control of Ireland for a brief while, but uh, ultimately defeated there at the Battle of the Boyne, uh, and the new, the new government was uh, well established. So it was a revolution, um, and the new government was out of the line of succession. James, of course, was still alive. Even if he were deemed not to be alive, he had a baby son who should have taken precedence over uh, Princess Mary. Uh, so the revolutionaries um, clearly were revolutionaries in the sense that they took power without the sanction of existing law. Who were the revolutionaries? <clears throat> they were uh, actually a coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some Whigs, that is uh, people who had always been uh, somewhat disenchanted uh, with the power of the monarchy. Um, but there were also Tories, the more conservative um, political group. It's only at this time that these, these uh, Whigs and Tories are starting to coalesce into actual political parties. The Tories were unhappy because they were high church Anglicans. And uh, they despised a Roman Catholicism uh, as much or more than anyone else. So it was kind of a coalition of these two groups. Um, they sent a letter uh, to Prince William uh, of Orange, who was then the stockholder in the Netherlands, uh, inviting him to come. And he did. He accepted that invitation, uh, along with 15,000 armed men. So um, it was the last successful invasion of, the, uh, of England uh, in history. So what, so what brought you to this story? Why 1687, 1688? I, um, uh, I have been a uh, constitutional law school. And I'm interested especially in questions of the authority of constitutions. What makes a constitution a constitution? And when we start going down the chain of legality and we get to the constitution, you have to ask, what make, is, there anything, is there any law that makes a constitution a constitution? And the answer, I think, has got to be no. Uh, finally, a constitution has to rest on something not legal. It's got to rest on a factual uh, or a, a popular basis, a political basis. So when you're looking at that, the, what we're saying then is every legal system has to begin in revolution. There's always got to be a new start. Um, the, uh, and so I became interested in this question of revolution. What's particularly interesting about 1688, and which is the theme of the book, is that while this revolution was like every revolution in that regard, in that it broke the uh, essential rules of the Constitution, um, the participants were 
very reluctant to acknowledge that they were doing something illegal. So the rhetoric, the dominant rhetoric, not the exclusive rhetoric, but the dominant rhetoric of the uh, people who made the, the revolution was to announce that they were merely vindicating existing law mm -hmm. and that they had done nothing to break the law. This in part is, is um, understandable because their, their arguments against James II were that he was an outlaw. He had failed to recognize the laws um, uh, establishing the church, the laws that limited what a king could do without the consent of parliament. These were all contested, but they certainly believed it. Um, and so uh, their position was that they were vindicating the law. Um, and having done that, they therefore tried to downplay the fact that they were vindicating that law by breaking another basic law. Uh, and that, was, that created a kind of cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. which they, uh, were, um, they, they could not acknowledge. And so they reinvented redefined what they were doing. What in such sources a way would they draw from? So when they would do that reinvention and have different legal rhetorics, yes. what sort of sources would they? Well, I mean, there, there are a couple of different kinds of sources. Most important is precedent. Mm -hmm. And so they would look back, obviously, the, the course of the English monarchy from, uh, say, from William the Conqueror on, was not a smooth uh, path of um, political inheritance, uh, so that uh, they would look at other occasions where what they call parliament, or the analog of what was then parliament, had, um, had chosen a new king. Uh, and, and, and where they, they believed this was a, this was a legal, um, there was legal continuity throughout. So they talked about things that happened in the Wars of the Roses. Um, they talked about uh, the deposition of Edward II, although they, again, they didn't call it a deposition. They, call, they showed this is a case where they, the throne became vacant and the, the estates of the realm were able to fill it. Um, the other kind of law which they um, depended on was what we might collectively call the, the ancient constitution, uh, which was written, has been written about, of course, by J.G.A. Pocock in his, in his great book about that subject. That is, the ultimate authority of the estates, they said, was, was cemented into the English constitution from a time before memory. Um, and there, there were manifestations of it. There were the so-called laws of Edward the Confessor. It turns out they were actually a fraud, a forgery. The laws of Edward the Confessor, the uh, Magna Carta, needless to say, um, the um, coronation oath. Uh, these all, uh, for these revolutionaries, reflected the basic law, which allowed, under certain circumstances, the estates to choose a king when there was no king in being. Uh, so, uh, their arguments were, were fully, not fully legal. Sometimes, and this is some of the, the most interesting moments in the history, sometimes they ran up against an obvious illegality in what they were doing. And then what they would say was, well, this is not exactly legal. But under the circumstances, this is about as close to legal as we can get. So for example, the body that voted William and Mary king and queen it was called the convention. They didn't call it, at first, they didn't call it a parliament. Um, it, was, uh, it, it was William uh, of Orange issued election uh, summonses. S they, uh, these elected um, representatives assembled in the House of Commons. The House of Lords assembled. Um, and they said, and, but, but it was, that couldn't be a parliament. Why wasn't it a real parliament? Parliaments could only exist when they were called by the king. Right? And clearly, the king had not called this body together. But, when they, but uh, when they made these arguments, John Summers, later to become Attorney General, said, here we have the essence of a parliament, the essentials of a parliament, a free representative, uh, the Lords uh, the, the, uh, assembled, so that this is, um, uh, this is as close to a parliament as we can get. The only alternative, someone would say, well, you really want a parliament, you've got to call King James back. And that was something they were, they were unwilling do, although some people actually argue for it. I should stress that even though all of these people were making legal arguments, on the fringes outside of the parliament, you can find pamphlet literature which recognizes that this is a real revolution and which urges the participants to take advantage of the moment. Most prominent among these people, John Locke, a famous letter in which he wrote, in which he said, it bothers me 
that the convention is assembling and acting as if they're just a parliament and not something greater. If they don't see that, this, may, this is a moment for change which may never come again. Um, but Locke's position was decidedly um, a fringe position. The people in the convention, the people who, had the, who were making the decisions, they were, uh, they were determined not to play the Lockean card, as somebody said. They were determined that they would make things as continuous as possible. I, I should say that the, the, one of the reasons why this attitude was so prevalent among the, the, the powerful people was a lot of these people had lived through the middle of the century. That is the time when the king had had his uh, head cut off, when there were these repeated constitutional experiments, the protect, finally the protectorate of Cromwell, mm -hmm. um, and it was a, a, and a, of course, needless to say, too bloody uh, and uh, incredibly destructive civil wars. That was something that they did not want to open the door to again. That, they thought, was the consequences of abandoning the, the ancient law. And so they say, we're going to make this, I, I, I hate to say that they, they pretended, because many of them were very sincere. Uh, and they really believed that the, what they were doing was as close to law as a person could come. Uh, there must have been some cynics, but mostly, mostly not. Mostly these were people who felt they were in a difficult situation and they wanted to go as far down the straight and narrow so as be, possible. To be able to do, to tell that kind of story that you're telling sounds to me at least like just a labor of love in the archives. I don't, like I'm not sure exactly. But uh, well, for me, for me it was. Um, um, doing historical research, certainly during the period when I, was, when I was doing it, required traveling to archives. You couldn't go on the internet and do a few clicks and come up with, uh, with the relevant documents. So I spent a good deal of time uh, in England uh, in various collections there at the Public Records Office, it's now, now called the uh, National Archives, um, going through printed material, but also manus manuscript material. And I, um, while much of what I report in this book is stuff which has been known, there are from time to time things which, which I, I think I discovered and had not been paid attention to before. And if you've never sat in a manuscript room and held in your hand a letter from someone who you have been uh, 300 years old from someone who you have been studying for, for years and suddenly see that person's uh, writing, that is a thrill uh, otherwise, I think, not available uh, in the academy. Maybe that's what, what chemists feel right. when they discover a new, <laughs> a new compound. But Could you tell us an anecdotal story about research as an art, like so many people now are turning to archival research, intellectual histories, post-Cambridge school, whatever have you? Um, well, I mean, the, the, I, I, there's, there's one story which, uh, which sticks in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's one of the incidents which I talk about in the last chapter of the book is about the, exam the House of Lords examination of Viscount Preston. Viscount Preston had claimed to be a peer of England, but his claim was based on a patent of nobility which had been signed by King James after he had left England and was living in France. Uh, when he made this claim, uh, the House of Lords was incensed and insisted that he uh, summoned him and insisted that he be, be brought to, um, to answer to them. The, um, it's, it's a significant story because once having done that, the House of Lords itself got tied up into knots about what crime this guy could have possibly committed. So I knew all about that, and I had read reports of it. I was in the, the British Library manuscripts and going through a, a bound collection of, of manuscript folios, and there is the summons that called forth, that called Lord Preston to, to the House of Lords, which I thought was wonderful, the original. And I flipped it over, and there were notes clearly scribbled by Preston as to what he plans to say to the House of Lords. So it's something that you feel a connection then with something which is, which is important to you and which goes back over the centuries in a way which I think uh, seeing something on a screen can never do for you. 
Although eventually, I think even even our manuscript research is going to end up being digital research too, as more and more uh, material is digitized. Mm. Uh, it's it is a, it is a, a great pleasure. I did I did much of this work. I should mention it at the Folger Shakespeare Library oh. in in Washington, which has the best collection of 17th century English material anywhere, and also as far as I'm concerned, the best librarians anywhere. Um, so they do have some manuscript material, but lots and lots of printed books, um, and and wonderful people around who, mm -hmm. who who can help you both both the readers and the staff. Well, Richard, thank you so much. The book is uh, The Glorious Revolution and the Continuity of Law. Pick it up. We've been with Richard S.K. Thank you so much for being here.